All right, let's get started. Hey, can I tell you guys a story? 17 years ago, my firm, LaCourse Design, was hired by Grant Kirkpatrick and Eric Evans at KA Design. And over the next five years, we worked with them to create their marketing and brand communications. Pardon my lack of humility, but I have to say it was pretty damn good work. And uh, the, um, the thing that we, that we worked with them was helping to tell their story and, and, uh, and move things forward. And um, they were an awesome client. And a lot of times what happens is, uh, what was great about it was that the work we were creating was you know, intellectually stimulating, it was fun, and they even introduced me to other clients, one of which was Keith Granite. And then I met uh, Chris Barrett and several other LDC members, and we worked together. And one of the things that we did with them was we helped create what became their brand experience division. And this wasn't a great business move on my end because this new division that they had and my firm offered the exact same services. And as a result, we were made redundant and let go. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you've had experiences where you lost a great client. And man, that can be tough. You know, in this case, it was more than just losing a great client, but they had really become my friends. And I know that happens in your world as well. And oftentimes what happens is with pain comes gain. Thank goodness. The pain part's not fun. But what I gained was this realization that if we could be so easily replaced by their in-house division, then we were essentially, then other firms could probably replace us and we were basically just a commodity. And I knew that things had to change. And so what I did was narrowed my focus. I was working in a lot of different industries before and I made the conscious decision to just work in the architecture engineering world. I also, as I was uh, developing deeper expertise, I was sharing that knowledge generously through writing and through speaking conferences like this. And while I was speaking and writing, I was harnessing the power of story. So fast forward, three years ago, I get a call from Grant and he says, hey David, I just got this email from you. It's on the power of story. He said, I get a lot of these from different vendors and I don't read all of them, but yours are thoughtful and they offer value and interesting information. It's not just all about your firm, it's how you can help other people. And he said, you know, I've admired your voice and I want to harness your voice to help our firm tell ours. And this led to a very small consulting project, which led to a bigger consulting project, and eventually the launch of Evans Architects and Kirkpatrick Architects. The beauty was is that we were the only firm considered for the job. And it was so validating to get that phone call and get that work because before we were just a commodity, and now we had transitioned to develop enough expertise that I got this call and I got this, this gig. So my point to this story is continually deepen your expertise, which then builds knowledge that I think you should share generously. And the way you should share that knowledge generously is harnessing the power of story. Now, I recognize that a lot of you are already storytellers and you've got this you know, you've got these skills, but I've got to guess that you chose to come to this session because you want to get better and you want to improve. Well, I want to improve too, and I can always learn more, so I want to tap into the collective intelligence that's in this room, and I expect you guys to participate and share some of your stories as we move forward. Does that sound all right? Cool. So, you fall into one of two camps. Either you're sort of excited and you feel comfortable with storytelling, and so in which case you're kind of like my sister, 40 two years ago, we're in Greece, and she's looking around, and she's excited, and she wants to know what's happening, or you're nervous, you're scared about storytelling, and you're kind of like me, <laughs> holding on to my mommy, crying because the donkey is smelly, and it's uncomfortable, and I wasn't excited about it. I'm hoping that today's session goes well, so I don't have to call my mommy again, and I can say, when I came back to Greece, 42 years later, it was a positive experience. So let me share with you where we're gonna to go today. Pretty simple, three kind of main things that we're gonna talk about. The first of which is why I think you should lead with story. Secondly, which three stories you should tell and tell masterfully. And then finally, how to actually tell these stories. Does that sound good? How about an opa? Opa! Let's get started. So just to give you a precursor, these are the three stories that you should tell really well. 
and we're going to fill in some blanks about where you should tell them and what sort of plot types work really well. Let me give you some sense. I see a lot of you taking notes. You don't have to furiously take notes because this entire presentation is going to be available to you to download. You can then use it with your staff or other people. And what I've done is I've created a special... Um, the, the, the only thing you really have to write down is this address. Cocktails. We have the cocktails. Yeah, yeah. So at this web address, there's a whole slew of information for you. There's books to go further. There's podcasts I think you should listen to about story. There's articles. And you can then download the presentation. This icon that you see right here is going to show up several times. There's so much I want to share with you about this topic, but we only have 45 minutes. So if you're into this, go to that, that page and you can go further, you know, as deep as you want to go. So every time you see this little icon, I'm suggesting you do a little outside homework. I'm not going to grade it. You don't have to turn it in, but I think it'll be better. So the way it's going to work today, I'm going to talk, I hope you guys are going to talk, and there's going to be a little bit of in-class assignments, and we'll, we'll learn a lot and have some fun at the same time. All right, so let's get started. Why should you lead with story? And I want to recognize that the fact that that, that dual meaning of the word lead is absolutely intentional. So what I mean by that is that you should begin with story, and you should use it as a leadership tool. Let's focus on the leadership part of it. The fact is, is that leaders tell a story. So what I want you to do real quickly is think of somebody that you consider to be like one of the most profound leaders that you can think of. It could be in government, it could be in business, it could be design. And just write their name down on your paper in front of you. We'll just take, I don't know, 30 seconds. Write down a name or two of somebody you consider to be a really outstanding leader. <coughs> it could be yourself if you lack humility. All right, so here's my list. These are four people that I consider to be really outstanding leaders. And the common thread between all these folks, probably some of you wrote down. Anybody write down any of these folks? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, these guys are all amazing storytellers. Now, I don't know if it, it's sort of a chicken or the egg conundrum, right? I don't know what comes first. I don't know if you become a great storyteller because you're a great leader, or you become a great leader because you're a great storyteller. And I don't think it matters, the correlation or the causation. I think it just matters that the two are linked, and it's just a really great, powerful tool to be able to use to lead. <coughs> As Plato said, people that tell stories use the world. Now, I'm going to incorporate some Greek philosophers. Every time I do that, I'd like you guys to raise your glass and yell, Opa. All right, can we practice that again? Opa! All right. <laughs> Anybody recognize this guy? You're close. It, it does start with an A. Aristotle. Aristotle, right. And Aristotle is sort of thought of as the architect of persuasion. And he had what I sort of like to think of as the big three. And these three things were the foundation of persuasion. And story can be a really powerful tool for persuasion. Let me sort of clarify why I think persuasion is important. One, you've got to persuade prospective clients to come and hire you, right? And then once they do decide to hire you, You've got to persuade them to adopt a vision and to move your projects forward in a way that you think is the best for them. So these three things that he, uh, I like to think of sort of like a three-legged stool. And each one of these three legs is really essential. Because without each one of these, you're really on your rear end, and that's a terrible place to be persuasive. So these three things are ethos, which is sort of the ethical, or uh, what's sort of thought of as credibility, um, and story can be a great way to do that, to establish rapport with a prospective client. The second leg is logos, which is logic. This is more of the intellectual evidence for building a case or, or being persuasive that way. And then finally, the third one is pathos. And this is where story really shines, because this is where the emotional component comes in, that you can really affect change and, and be persuasive. Let me identify what I think are three problems that are, are facing you guys as an audience, and we'll talk about each one of these individually. The first one is, you're going to retire or you're going to die. And hopefully one happens before the other, right? But I know a lot of you work pretty hard, and so hopefully the retirement will happen. 
why do I think story can be effective in solving this is that I think you almost have an obligation to take what you've built and have it live beyond your working life. I think that leaving a legacy is something that you've worked hard to create, and I think it would be a shame for that legacy to die. How can story help translate that? Well, if you sort of look to, say, the Native American tradition, all that culture gets passed on from generation to generation via the power of story. And story can be used to identify your firm's values, your firm's successes, and can be a really effective way to train the next generation and to pass on that culture. The second thing is I think story can be really good about recruiting and retaining talent. Telling prospective employees you know, the vision of the firm, where the firm is headed, is a much better way than just sort of having them read facts and figures. And then retaining talent I think can be great because people like to hear stories and tell stories. So if an employee, and by the way, I think everybody in your firm should be able to tell your firm's story really well. I think we're, while not everybody is perhaps a rainmaker is going to negotiate deals, I think that they should have the ability to sort of tell the story effectively and be sort of this viral army out there uh, helping you move forward. But the retention part of it comes in the fact that if people can tell a story about your firm and be proud of it, I think they're going to have a, a more attachment to staying there for a long period of time. And even better if other people start to tell your firm story because that third party endorsement is really effective. Now this third one is a little bit controversial, but bear with me a little bit and I'd like to get your feedback on this. And it is that, I, that sometimes you're perceived as a commodity. And while I get the fact that each of you have a unique vision and you have a unique body of work, I'm not so sure that your clients always get that. Imagine this scenario. You are meeting with a prospective client, you show your work, they think you're somewhat charming, then they go and they meet with somebody else, their work is really good, they kind of like them too. They even meet with a third person and their work is nice and they're going to meet with them. That client has to make it a difficult decision. And if they struggle with differentiating between the three, then what do they have to sort of go on to make that choice? Yeah, price or fees. And that's definitely not a great way to build a brand, unless you're Walmart, and I don't think any of you want to be Walmart. So the thing with the, your story is that it's sort of like a fingerprint. Nobody else has your same story. And the more you can tap into that, the more you can differentiate yourself against the, the competition and the more you can differentiate and create this emotional connection that when they're making that buying decision, your firm is going to rise up to the top. And really the mission of the LDC is to elevate and enhance the value of design and story is such an effective way to do that. So what we're talking about is in line with sort of the bigger picture and uh, that's all we have to do. All right, so any questions about why you should leave with story? Or comments about what we've talked about so far? Guys are just engaged, all right. Let's keep moving then, because there's lots I want to share. So I'm sort of a checklist maker. We finished section one, we're moving on to section two, which is which three stories should you tell and tell really well? And before we talk about what three stories, I think I need to define the word story because it's a term that is a little bit overused these days. I think we have become a little bit uh, liberal with our use of story in that you hear things like, oh, that, that room tells a story, or you hear terms like, our brand is our story. Your brand is not your story. Story has a very specific beginning, middle, and end. Unless you want your brand to end, don't align it with being a story. I think your brand could be made up of a lot of individual stories, but it's not a story in and of itself. So the way I define story is that it's, a, it's an account of how and why life changes. And I think there's a very specific structure to story. And that structure looks like this. There's a setup, there is the conflict, turning point outcome, and all these, number one through four, support your point. We'll talk about each one of these individually. But you've probably heard the term like arc of a story, and that's really kind of what we're talking about. And so I think this sort of true definition of story has all these five elements 
that make up that make up the story. So let's talk about setup. So this is the why, the what, the where, the sort of establishing shot. If this was a movie, it would show us all here in Athens in the Hotel George. It's the group of LDC. We're listening to some guy talk about story. It's kind of the the way in which the real sort of goal of the setup is to get your audience to like the protagonist or the main characters. And then from there, we move into conflict. Now, in order for a story to be effective, and this might seem a little bit weird, it has to have some sort of tension. And I think David Burke has talked a lot about this you know, yesterday. There needs to be a little bit of agitation to create a compelling story. You've probably read a book or seen a movie where everything just kind of moves along kind of nicely. And there's no sense of drama, and it's just really not all that interesting. Now, this conflict or tension can happen internally. In fact, some of the best stories are when you are wrestling with internal decisions. You're not quite sure about how to take something and move forward with it. And then you have maybe some sort of epiphany, and that leads to a new way of doing things. But there's got to be some form of conflict. Otherwise, it's really not a story. Robert McKee um, is a a consultant to, to Hollywood uh, screenwriting industry. So, Joey, will you read this for me? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'll yeah, pick on the horse guy. guy. <coughs> somebody must be at this dead hog. You gotta pick somebody else. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other volunteers? <laughs> help them out. Ray, can you help us? <laughs> Something must be at stake convinces the audience that a great deal will be lost if the hero doesn't take his own. Nothing is at risk. <laughs> so point number three is the, the turning point in the story. This is like when the light bulb goes off or it's the aha moment. So if we use my story that I told in the beginning as the, the example, it was when I realized that my firm was simply a commodity and I needed to make that change. So it's a catalyst for some sort of change that needs to the outcome is basically how the story ends. It's where everything sort of comes down together. You tie things up really nicely. In my case, the story that I told, it was developing this new direction to help firms use you know, their story to attract great clients and great talent. And then again, all these things need to support your point. The reason you're sort of telling a, a story is that you need to make a point. And so steps one through four need to support that. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to play a little game here, right? So David Burke has talked about uh, improv <coughs> yesterday, and we're going to do this little improv exercise. So what I need is four volunteers, and we're going to sort of build a very short story, a very silly one, it, it you know, doesn't have to be perfect, right here in the room. And so I'm going to need a volunteer from this table, so you guys figure out who that might be. How about some, one from this table? And then this table and that table. And then we'll, we'll do something fun for you guys as well. <laughs> so figure out who your, your person's going to be. Okay, so yeah, all right. Here's the deal. Um, the point of this story is my hero is a hero, the sandwich, right? So we're gonna build a story that makes the point that my hero is a hero, a hero sandwich, right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of clues as you go along. So you're gonna talk for maybe I don't know. 10 to 20 seconds to start off, and then at a certain point it'll be up, and then the table two person will come. This is table three, and then table four over there. All right? Okay, so here's the, let's get started with the setup. Tim, take it away. Yeah, just okay. sort of make something up. Uh, and, and, oh, by the way, it'd be kind of funny if you incorporated people in the room. Just a little tip. But, <clears throat> no pressure, no pressure. No pressure, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was traveling from London to Athens in coach on my way to Egypt uh, for a conference, and I missed my flight in Athens and got stuck with no money and uh, in the middle of downtown Athens, and I was very happy. Very good. Okay. Which 
left me, um, I had no resources, there's my son, but I had no resources, I was starving. Um, so, um, uh, I, I was, I was, I, listen, I want to take it to the turn. Um, I, I, it was very, very upsetting. Yeah, talk about how painful that was. It was so was. painful. Uh, <laughs> I felt like one, I felt like the dog in front of the hotel. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, that's I, that's I, right. Right. Oh, I found a knife, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, I swear, I wanted to cut myself. Uh, <laughs> 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 and when I, 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 just when I was about to do that. <laughs> uh, are you leaving a big, okay. The dog talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> Walked out a couple of streets and found the perfect organic chicken yellows. <laughs> I didn't hear it. <laughs> the dog spoke to him. I thought he said something different than he said. Well, then go with that. And then just go with that. It's yes and, right? So it's whatever you heard and keep it moving forward. Okay, so the dog talked to you and he walked up the street. No, 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 yeah, no, right. Let her wrap and outside, it up. And outside this little Euro shop that was really beautiful, and it was family owned. It was, this, it was family owned. There was this little lady, and she saw that I had been stabbed. Yes, by myself with no money, had missed my flight, not a friend in the world, and she remembered a kindness someone had paid to her. When she was in the United States, in a Walmart, okay. <laughs> <laughs> with a short three cents at the register, and had to put back, you know, her hot hamburger buns, and, <laughs> and okay. she said, "Come in, come in, sit down." I'm going to feed you with my family. I love it. Okay, so Marcus, <laughs> so will you, will you just sort of conclude and say, and that's why... And that's why my hero is a Euro maker. All right, a big round for everybody. <laughs> See what we did there? We built a real simple story. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Are there other people that want to play? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, if we have time, we'll come back to this, all right? So now we've defined story. Let's clarify what are these three stories that you need to tell really well. And I alluded to this earlier. But we'll focus in on first the about me, but then we'll get into the about my firm and whom I've helped. <coughs> now, the about me story, the real point of an about me story is to explain to somebody not just what you do, but why you do it. Because I firmly believe that people don't just buy what you do, they buy why you do it. They want to align themselves in terms of values, they want to feel like, yes, this person gets me. And the, the more they sort of can say, my designer you know, does this sort of thing and we are so connected, I think the more invested they're going to be in the project and the more value that they're going to get out of it. Because people simply do business with people they know. And the only way that they can really get to know you, or one way that's really effective in order to get to know you, is for you to tell your about me story. Now you might be thinking, if you're a sole practitioner, if you have a real small firm, it's quite possible that your about me story and your about my firm story are real interrelated. But if you have a bigger firm, you probably want to have two separate things. I think you want to have one where you, they get to know you as an individual because they're going to possibly be working with you as that project manager or the principal on that job. And then the About My Firm would be a, a distinct story. And we'll talk about the differences there. So if your biography is simply just a sort of recounting of facts, which is the way mostly it's done, I'd like to encourage you to recast that as an actual story, which has the ability to communicate your character. And as somebody has the potential to get to know your character, they're going to be, feel much more connected and I think you're going to have a higher chance of being hired for that job. So about me stories can take several different forms. I'm going to give you a little catalyst to think about which of these four stories might be the foundation for your about me story. It might be an event from your youth 
where it predicted you eventually becoming a designer. It might be simply why did you become a designer? And they may be different. Uh, it could be a moment where you're working or with a client and it really confirmed that yes, this is in fact my calling. And then fourth, it could be some sort of key turning point in your career. So let's take a minute to have you write down maybe just some simple notes about which, just pick one of these that you feel most resonates with you and write down a couple of little plot points for how you could sort of go off and do your homework and elaborate and flesh out this story. So hopefully that's excited you to take this further and that can be some of your homework. So this table didn't get to participate quite as much. Applause for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's transition into the about my firm story. And this can also be sort of why your firm, well let me give you some suggestions about different plot points that might work really well for an about my firm story. Maybe it's a founding story. Why did your company get started in the first place? That could be very powerful. It could be a purpose story, which is why you do what you do, your mission or your purpose. And then also it could be a vision story, which is where the firm is headed going forward. Now this of course would be a, a, a work of fiction, right? Because it doesn't exist yet. But I think this story can be really effective for recruiting and retaining uh, talent because it gives somebody a sense of the trajectory that the firm's on and where you're going and if they align with those values or not, and I think that's part of the process, it's sort of a dating process, is it the right fit? Then they can sort of self-select about whether they would be a good team member for your, for your firm as well. And uh, I think clients would like to hear this story too because they want to have a sense of, of where you are going to go, you know, moving forward. Of course, you know, they're about sort of the now and their project, but since so many of your projects last two, three years, it's good to know what your vision story is. All right, so let's talk uh, the who might help story. And this can sort of take many different forms. Sometimes it's called a case study. But what I would love and where I distinguish between a case study and a who might help story is really sort of the emotional component and not just sort of a listing of facts, not just square footage, not just number of rooms, not just timing, but the emotional component of how you help that person, how they were, you know, take how you took that client on this emotional arc of the journey of working with you over time. And so here are some possible, and so by the way, I think you should have several stories within your sort of back pocket that you pull out at the most appropriate times. And you might even start a spreadsheet or have sort of little folders for each of these stories. And depending on the scenario, you pull out the most appropriate story for that scenario. So for example, you should probably have, I think you should have one of these stories that you tell you know, at different times. And one of which is the value of design story. So somebody comes to you and says, gosh, I love your work, but I just can't get my head around why your fees are three times your friend down the street, right? And you've probably heard some variation of that. And if you have a story that say, you know what, I, I get that and you acknowledge the fact that you're probably successful because you're talking to the client here is that you know, you're financially intelligent and you want to know what kind of return on investment you're getting. And so let me tell you a story and then you launch into a story about how you help the client and if you have any sort of financial information including that, you know, they bought their home at 1.2, they sold it four years later after we redesigned it for 4.5, that's a pretty powerful like, business case. Uh, of why the value of design matters. Now, I also think there's the emotional component, right? The, the joy and the beauty that you offer that, and to me, that's priceless. So either way, you take this value of design story, whether you tap into sort of the, the financial part or the emotional part, I think it's a, a fantastic story. And ideally, weaving those two things together is even greater than the sum of the parts. Every project has a building challenge, whether it be a difficult lot, whether it be working with zoning, or I live in California, the, the Coastal Commission, um, whether it be a timing issue, there's always some sort of building challenge that is a really effective way. To, because somebody's gonna say, why does it take two and a half years? And if you have a story that maybe tells the fact that maybe earlier in your career you tried to shortcut that process, 
and you had this epiphany because it kind of failed. And if you can sort of reveal that vulnerability and say, hey, look, this is where I screwed up. I'm never going to do that again because it shortcuts the value of your home. Then I think that could be a really effective story. Oh, and then by the way, the, um, the trusting your designer. So I would say just about in every project, there's an opportunity or there's a time when the client gets a little bit of cold feet. And while I wouldn't call it buyer's remorse, I would just say if you're creating significant change, then sometimes people need to sit with that for a little while. And, and if you have a story about when you successfully moved somebody through that process and held their hand, and, and if it just sort of like puts a nice security blanket around the client and say, look, can I tell you a story? And by the way, that's a great way, just simple language to sort of launch into a story. Nobody says no to can I tell you a story. And you say, and then you go on and tell a story about how there was this client we were working with, and they weren't quite sure whether it was right, and they, they trusted their designer, and it worked out really magically. And then you know you pull out your edition of AP where your work has been published. That can be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, let me show you this video. So this is an example of a uh, of whom we've helped story. And just to set it up, this is a client of mine. Um, Randy Mendioros from Aquatic Design Group. They build, uh, they're architects and engineers and they build things that relate to water. So like the whole water structure of the Venetian Hotel. He's gonna tell a story about your alma mater, the University of Texas, in fact, um, about a project. And uh, so I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. question comes my way, I always think of the story of a, a project that we did for the University of Texas at Austin. It was a series of new pools uh, as part of the Student Recreation Center. And things went well throughout the entire design process. The project was under construction. And we basically had some problems in the early spring, just before the, the, the pools were getting ready to be opened up. Um, the pools weren't coming up to temperature. It was a very cold spring that, that year in Texas. and and but. The pools should have been warming up quite a bit quicker than they were. And so when we investigated, we found that we had undersized the pool heating. So we would have relied heavily on a vendor to size these units for us, and they obviously missed it. And so when we discovered it, discovered the problem, we advised the client right away that there was a problem. And it was getting close to the grand opening. And so we had maybe five to six weeks before the, the scheduled grand opening did was we said, look, we're going to take care of this. Uh, we arranged with the vendor that we had worked with to ship the properly sized units to the project site. We also made arrangements with the local contractor to actually redo the steam piping, take out the ones that were improperly sized, put in the new ones, and we provided a superintendent from our office to go out and supervise the entire construction process. Well, it was a very painful experience for us because we wrote checks totaling eighty-seven thousand dollars, and our original design contract was only one hundred and forty thousand dollars. But what we found after the fact, when we opened the facility on time, the project manager for UT Austin, Tom Dyson, said it was the first time he's ever seen number one a design professional admit that they had made a mistake. Number two work so quickly to correct it and open the facility on time. And so he said that if UT Austin ever did a swimming pool again, it would only be with aquatic design group because of the way that we stepped up. And I think we earned a lifelong client as long as this particular project manager is still at UT Austin, we're guaranteed a job the next time they do a swimming pool. Yeah, so that's a really powerful one able to admit, hey, we screwed up, but it never is going to happen again because this is what I learned. So any questions about what three stories you should tell? All right, let's keep rocking. How to tell your stories. And before you can tell the story, you need to write that story. So I want to give you some tips about how you would construct or start to build these particular stories. And we're going to just focus in on the about me story, but the same 
method or process you would use to write your About Me story, you would also use to do the Who Am I Helped and the About My Firm. So remember, this is the, the sort of five plot points. And the way you tell the story is most likely in chronological order, and it's most likely one, two, three, four, five. There may be a scenario where you make the point first, tell the story, and then circle back to the point. Uh, but I'll, of course, leave that up to you. That's how you tell the story. How you actually write the story is a little bit in reverse. And it sort of builds on the sort of premise of begin with the end in mind, right? You want to start with the point. You want to be really clear about what story you're telling and why. Then what you want to do is, after you've discovered the point, and the example I'm showing here is going back to the story that I told in the beginning. The reason I told that story to you is I wanted to communicate why I do what I do, which is to help firms fight commoditization and to attract new business. And then the second thing you want to do as you're crafting the story is figure out where it's going to end up. So you've discovered the point, so you go to number four, which is the outcome. In my example, it was this new way of, of working with clients that was much more focused and harness the power of story. The setup, as you heard, you know, it's, it was Grant and I, and the work we did, and then the conflict, and then finally the turning point. So is this clear, the, the fact that you tell the story one way, but you actually write it another way, and then you go back and tell it in the chronological order? This just helps you logically think through how the story is going to be best. All right, so how to tell your stories. And the first thing I think you can learn or take away, and I've heard this term used a lot in this time of conference, is this idea of showing vulnerability. Because it's such a powerful way to help connect with a potential audience. Your clients probably in, in some cases have this notion that not only do they think your homes are perfect, but they also probably think your lives are perfect. And because I know some of you, and I've gotten to know some of you, I know that that's not true, right? And none of us are perfect. And in fact, what makes us appealing as human beings is probably more our imperfections than our perfections. And if you can reveal and uh, share these things, it can be a really powerful tool. So it's really not a weakness. In fact, it's, a, it's actually, an, there's advantages to showing vulnerability. And it sort of has to do, and it's very grounded in what we're learning with neuroscience. We can wire somebody through an fMRI machine while they're telling a story, and we can wire somebody who's receiving that story. And there's this thing that happens uh, called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are sort of best described as monkey see, monkey do. If I open myself up and I tell a revealing story, there's most likely going to be sort of the reaction or, or counting back of you're going to be more willing to tell me your story. And that's so effective, because when you have a prospective client that feels safe enough to tell you their story, that's ammunition for you to use in your proposal. It's intelligence that you've gained to best solve those problems when you're creating your design solutions so that they're really grounded in solving tangible problems. So the vulnerability part is so powerful. And by going first, you're setting a stage of like, OK, it's safe. We're going to be authentic. We're going to be real. We're not going to have a lot of pretense. I'm one of you. Let's just get down to work. If you want to go further on this, Brene Brown, is, uh, you probably may have read her, read her books, her, her TED Talk is phenomenal. It's one of the top, I think, five or 10 TED Talks. She has a PhD in vulnerability from the University of Houston. And man, this talk is really effective. Anybody seen this or heard of her? Yeah, it's really, really good. So as you're telling your story, the more you can simplify and utilize clear, succinct language. As designers, we have this tendency to sort of fall into what I call, you know, ARCA speak or design speak, where we use terminology that's fun to impress our friends with, but people just look at you like, what's a plinth? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, like, so the more you connect via sort of speaking human and using order and simplicity, the more effective you're going to be. And there's nothing like telling your, your story in person especially in this digital world we, we live in. <clears throat> so you want to make your story stick. And I want to give you some uh, tips for how to actually do that. And one of which is to add the emotional component. So rather just recounting facts and figures, sort of talk about how that made you feel. You know, I felt terrible when I lost the work for KAA because they had become my friends. So that makes a, a story become three-dimensional. It makes it become real. 
You also want to tell a story as if it's happening now, rather than sort of using the past tense. Even if it happened in the past, tell us as if it's happening now. And one great way to use that is to incorporate dialogue. If you can say, he said, and she said, then it feels very real and it feels very, like somebody has this window into this almost private conversation. Now, let's be clear about why you want to make your story sticky. And that is that you're not going to be present when the buying decision is made. So when somebody makes a decision to actually work with you, you're not going to be sitting in that room. It's going to be on a Sunday night, and they've got to get back to you on Monday, and they've got to make a decision. And if your story rises to the top, you're going to be more memorable and hopefully the one that gets chosen for that particular job. In terms of training your staff, I think story can be really great. I think, like I said before, everybody should be able to tell your firm's story. And I, I would suggest maybe doing something like start a, a storytelling workshop on every Friday at lunch, right? And, and somebody on your staff is responsible for telling some story. At first, don't make it like the, the three stories. Maybe just have them feel comfortable with sort of the main plot points and telling stories. And I think this could be a fun way for people to develop comfort in terms of being storytellers. And I'm totally convinced it's a learned skill. I've been going to Toastmasters for like 10 years and see people walk in the first meeting and you know they can barely sort of tell their story. They look down at their shoes. And I've seen like three months later where they just blossom and they really learn how to tell a story. And I think so it's, it's definitely learned. So where should you tell your stories? Here are some different possible venues. You know, like I said, instead of a bio, maybe it's a story that's about me that can take place in video. A self-intro is like when you meet somebody for the first time and they say, what do you do? And then having this story that can be really compelling. The about my firm can take place in all these different venues, and then the who might have helped could happen here. All right, so any questions about how to tell your story? Yeah. Yes? Um, for this, you say there's three architects in here. Yeah. They're all being interviewed by the same client. They've all heard you talk. <laughs> right. Okay. So everybody comes in with their story, and it's clearly not a commodity. Right. Now, now what do you is do? It the, is it the sophistication and the, and the charm of the story that brings it over, or is there a fourth thing that we should I don't think there's a fourth <laughs> 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 secret key. Can you tell me afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have to hire you for that. That's a great question, but the deal is, is that everybody's story is unique, and I don't think you're right for every single job, right? So I think ultimately, the client is going to resonate more with one story versus the other. I mean, it would be wonderful if everybody was telling a real effective, authentic story, and then I think the client is going to make the decision that's right. You know, at a certain point, I think the sort of universe helps, and things just sort of happen the way they're supposed to happen. There isn't some secret sort of like extra special story. I think you have to tell your story the way it works, and if it works out, it works out, and if not, there's probably somebody else out there that could be a better fit. So it's a case. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to clarify when you were talking about telling telling stories with your staff. Yeah. Were you saying to teach them the story that you're? trying to tell, or were you saying just get in the practice? I think at tell. first, yeah, just get in the practice of using story, but I think eventually, yeah, teaching them to tell the story of their firm, and then eventually maybe they'll feel comfortable telling the About Me story, and or some of these uh, Who We've Helped stories. Just to follow up on that, um, what if you have someone who's really long-winded? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they love to tell a story, right. and then just sort of never winds it up, or it looks like you. I think this iPad timing tool is really good for that. <laughs> they can visually see the clock going and, uh, but yeah, I think succinctness, and I think you should have a about me story that's a short story, a long form story, and you've got to make a decision, like if you're in a cocktail party, you're not going to tell the long form story. You've got to sort of get to the real quick sort of meaty part and have two versions of that same story. Are you training your staff to tell, for small practice, you're training your staff to tell your story? Well, I think they should probably have both. Or have they yeah, so if it's a small staff, um, and let's say they have a very specific role, I think they should tell the story of why they do that particular role. I think they should have a separate story that's the about my firm story right. that could be one of those plot points that I mentioned. It's important to teach them when to put their own story out. Yeah, exactly. Not to. Right, right. 
Yes. It's always good to know when to whip out the right story, for sure. All right, so next steps. We're going to wrap things up. I think anytime you, know, you want to learn something, the best way to do it is teach it to somebody else. Download the slides, share it with somebody you love and know. Here's my favorite books on this story. You'll get a list of those if you go to the website. Here's what that looks like. Got these. I'm a big podcast person. I love listening to stories. So there's a list of really phenomenal uh, podcasts here that uh, I think are really terrific for taking things further. I think you should promote yourself to the chief story officer. That's your new role. And if it's not you, then it should be somebody else. I think somebody in your firm needs to be tasked with being the keeper of the story. You know, like a Native American that was the chief of the tribe. And I think having somebody as sort of the shepherd of your stories, and they should catalog those, and they should archive them. In fact, you know, in the commercial world, there's this whole movement towards knowledge management. At a firm like Gensler, they have a chief knowledge officer, and that person is sort of like the firm librarian, so that if somebody ever leaves the firm or retires, all that knowledge doesn't get lost. It gets archived in some sort of intranet or, chief, or knowledge uh, management system. Hunting for stories. There are always stories out there. The key is just to recognize them. So anytime there's some sort of hurdle or challenge in what you're working on, jot that down. And it may be the foundation uh, point number three, which is the conflict part of an effective story. You also don't have to always tell personal stories or firm stories. There may be times when a more metaphorical story is more appropriate. And don't be afraid to use stories that come from, I don't know, Greek mythology, or oh. any sort of, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, Homer, go back and, and read some of your favorite ones. This is one that I like, uh, and I think it's the perfect metaphor for story, because story has this ability to reach through somebody's head to then reach their heart. And much like a Trojan horse, there's this hidden sort of extra prize within and that is that emotional connection that people listening to a story may not consciously get, but then they feel this affinity and they put themselves into that story. So just to wrap up, if somebody could just sort of shout out one thing that you learned today in terms of why you should lead with story that you're gonna take with you. To stick, oh, sorry. Yeah, to, to stick, to make a connection. To stick at the point of decision. At the point of decision, you're not going to be present. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you want to be memorable. What are the three stories you need to tell? About my firm. About my firm. Who am I about? And one thing you're going to take away that really stuck with you in terms of how to tell the story? The timer. The timer. All right. That's good. I think succinctness is key. Nice. So I love this, and we're going to conclude with this, which is tell me a fact, and I'll learn Tell me a truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it'll live in my heart forever. You guys have been great. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Enjoy the next show.